peaceful death joyful rebirth a tibetan buddhist guidebook by tulku thondu introduction death is not the end the day of death is most crucial time for every person universally whether you are from east or the west whether you are a buddhist or a follower of some other teaching a believer or a non believer it makes no difference the moment when consciousness departs from your most cherished body will be a momentous turning point of your life for death will launch you on journey into an unknown world when the last hour is at hand you will stand at crossroad if you have prepared in advance you will be ready to move on with great ease and confidence like an eagle soaring into the sky if not according to buddhist teachings you will journey again and again through the passage of life death and rebirth most people do not like to be reminded of their inevitable death which may arrive at any moment they are scared even to think about it let alone discuss it to some the notion of contemplating death never even arises absorbed as they are in the affairs of daily living although people of faith express confidence in an afterlife many others insist that there is nothing at all after death today we are in the golden age of science and technology but the scope of our amazing knowledge about life ends where our breathing stops science and technology cannot offer the slightest clue to whether there is any continuity of our consciousness after our last breath researchers who study the question seriously are dismissed by the medical and scientific mainstream in these skeptical times people are often reluctant to believe in an afterlife or fear of being labeled irrational unsophisticated or naive dramatic images of death greet us whenever we turn on the television whether they are fictional deaths in a movie or new clips of people around the world scumbling some scumbling scumbling to disease or violence yet real natural images of ordinary individuals who are dying or deceased are seldom visible we are more likely to witness rosy geologies and bodies all made up in flowery caskets if only we dared to gaze at realities of life and death with open eyes we would receive a powerful demonstration of the ever changing cycles of existence that all being must endure from life to death and back to life again what happens at death the world's major religions agree that death is not the end that something survives although they differ in details and interpretation mind consciousness soul spirit whatever we call it will continue to exist in one form or another buddhism identifies mind as a fundamental nature that survives the death of the physical body do our bodies will dissolve back into the elements of which their form we will continue as a mind and consciousness which will transmigrate into another existence as long as we are alive the mind cohabits together with the body which provides an earthy structure that gives us a sense of identity thus we feel more or less like the same person throughout our lifespan environmental influences and cultural habits also imparts continuity of experience we have sense of solidity about our bodies and the phenomenal appearances of the material world around us all the things and happenings that arise within our awareness 
perceived by our senses seem totally real external and separate from our minds but at the moment of death all these appearances will vanish the mind will separate from the physical body which will begin to decay as soon as the consciousness departs from the body the things that we saw and the feelings that we had in life will change utterly what we experience after death will depend solely on our mind on the habitual mental tendencies and thoughts that we created and fostered while we were alive if our mind is peaceful and joyful then whatever we do physically will be an expression of peace and joy whatever we say vocally will be words of peace and joy then all our activities will become virtuous and we will be source of peace and joy to everyone we come into contact with at the time of death when we are released from the constraints of the physical body cultural restrictions and environmental influences we will be free to enjoy peace and joy the true disposition of our own mind similarly if we train our minds in proper way during life then at the time of death all the phenomena before us will arise as the world of peace joy and enlightenment but if our mind is immersed in negative emotions such as hatred then whatever we will think will be afflicted afflicted by thoughts and feelings of burning anger whatever we say or do will be an explosive expression of hatred and anger then the day of peace may never have a chance to dawn in our hearts our pain will become a source of hatred and a pain for those close to us at the time of death may may encounter a world burning in the flames of hell the manifestation of our own anger and hatred karma the nature natural law of casualty the world's greatest religion agree that a kind and helpful life will lead to a happy and peaceful existence after death whereas a hateful and harmful one will bring harsh consequences christianity for example extols good works and acts of charity and judaism urges the performance of good deeds commanded by torah buddhist speaks of merits which we accumulate by cultivating positive thoughts and deeds these and other traditions accept that natural law of causation operates in our universe karma is the word that buddhist use for this law which governs every event every mental and physical action initiated by mental volition becomes a cause that per precipitates an individual effect as the result buddhism in particular teaches in great detail what exact consequences will follow from what specific acts generally speaking the patterns of positive thoughts emotions words and deeds cause happiness with negative while negative mental and physical action cause suffering the events of life cycle all our destruction destructive emotions as well as our habitual mental concepts and patterns of thoughts are rooted in what buddhism calls grasping at self and the dualistic notion of subject and object as stated by nagarjuna one of the great philosophers of buddhism all beings have come from grasping at self that is the mind's tendency to grasp at and become attached to the objects of thoughts and perception is the very cause of our coming into existence in the world of duality grasping at self is the mind's way of perceiving mental objects by apprehending them as truly existing entities mental objects include all the phenomena that arise in our awareness such as myself you he she money or table as well as the ideas feelings and sensations such as pain as soon as we have grasped a mental object and held on to it as a real and solid we have formed a subject object duality then comes the concept of liking or disliking the mental object 
and that tightens the mental grip of grasping. In the end, there is a feeling of excitement or pain, full of stress and pressure. In the Buddhist view, self includes me and mine, but it also encompasses all phenomena arising in our consciousness. However, according to the highest understanding of Buddhism, there is no self that truly exists as solid, fixed, unchanging entity. Our grasping attitude is thus based on delusion. However, because we are in the grip of karma, our delusionary thinking and behavior result in pain and suffering that are all too real to us. That cycle of grasping goes on repeating itself continuously as the causal order, the karmic law of life. It produces and inflames the afflicting emotions, pleasure of confusion, hatred, miserliness, greed, jealousy, arrogance and fear. These afflicting emotions rooted in grasping at self are causes of rebirth, while positive states of mind are the means of liberation. The changing theatres of life, death and after death, take place neither by choice nor by chance. No one else has created them for us. They are reflections and reactions of our own thoughts, words and deeds. Therefore, we must train our minds and practice steadily to secure a happy and peaceful death and rebirth. The Cycle of Life death and after death. The endless delusory cycle of life, death and after death is known as samsara in Sanskrit. It is sometimes pictured as ceaselessly turning wheel as in illustration on page 172. Cyclic existence has been divided into four periods or passages representing different stages of experiences. The passages of this life starts at conception and end with fatal sickness or whatever is the cause of death. Each moment of existence is also considered a passage of life that arises and then dissolves in an endless chain of changing events moving between birth and death, waking and sleeping, happiness and suffering. 2. The passage of dying begins with the fatal sickness and goes through the gross and subtle dissolution when physical, mental and emotional component disintegrate. This phase aid at the cessation of breathing. 3. The passage of ultimate nature starts at the moment when the luminosity of the basis, the true nature of the mind as it is arises. This period is characteristic, characterized by spontaneous arising of luminous visions, the appearance not just of light but also of sound and images. It ends when these visions dissolve. However, ordinary people will not recognize the luminous visions as expressions of their own nature. Instead, they will perceive them all as an object of fear or attachment. For them, the experience will last only moment because they will fall into unconsciousness. Four, the transitional passage or bardo starts either when the spontaneously arisen visions dissolve or when we regain consciousness. It ends with the conception of our next life. In Tibetan Buddhist text, each of the four major periods or passages described above is considered bardo, an intermediate or transitional passage because each comes between the two other periods. Thus, even life is called boredom, strange as they may sound, for it is simply the transition between birth and death. Nevertheless, many people use the word bardo exclusively for the interval between death and the next birth, a momentous time rich with many vivid experiences and offering crucial opportunities for determining one's future existence. Therefore, in this book, I also use the term bardo to mean the fourth passage, the interval between the gleams of ultimate nature and the next rebirth. 
glimpses of the border to illuminate what it is like to cross the threshold of death and what we may meet on the other side i have translated and retold some of the amazing stories in tibetan buddhist literature about meditators who leave their physical body for days at a time to travel through the invisible world these meditators known as dilogs or those who return from the death would then come back to their bodies and record their extraordinary journeys which could span the west rungs of hell and the sublime pure lands pure lands are in effably joyful and peaceful paradises that the buddhas the enlightened ones manifested through their compassion so that devotees might take rebirth there without needing to be highly realized being reborn in a pure land is not the same as attaining enlightenment but once there you will make continuous progress towards enlightenment some dialogues tell of visits to pure lands where they receive teachings from the buddhas other dialogues spend more time describing the bardo its court of judgment and the various realm where ordinary beings may be reborn such as realms of hungry ghosts or gods dialogues account are deeply moving most dialogues are profoundly religious people and were sent back to our world by enlightened beings to tell us about what lies ahead and how to prepare for it each tale is a gift or by opening a window into vastness of our futures beyond this current life the logs broaden our perspective and inspire us to improve our lives through the logs eyes we become privy to the sort of things that will matter in determining whether we will where will we reborn we witness the power of spiritual practices to cleanse negative deeds and thoughts we realize the power of prayer to help the dead secure better rebirths we observe how devotion which is in reality a skillful way to open up our mind allows the lamas and blessed ones to intercede on behalf of beings in the bardo and lead them to pure lands most dialogues bring back messages from departed loved ones friends and relatives their personal pleas reinforce the basic message to change our lives while we are alive in human form and i have the chance in the west people who were received from revived from clinical death sometimes had a near death experience although ndes share many similarities with dialogue experiences they may last only few minutes or so whereas dialogue experience usually last many days dialogues also seem to penetrate much further into the after death realm many dialogue texts came into my hands However, due to some limitation, I could not include. I could include only small part of them in the book. The accounts you will read in chapter two, three, and five generally date from the 19th to mid 20th century. Dating was not available for all the texts. Dialogues are not a modern phenomenon. However, nor are they exclusively Tibetan. They are discussed in the teachings of. As you read the accounts, some of you might wonder why the tales are tinted by Tibetan and Tibetan Buddhist culture and iconography. How come the dialogues keep meeting Tibetan acquaintances? Why do the judges resemble those in Buddhist iconography? The main answer is that the terrain that unfolds before us in the bardo is a reflection of our habits and emotions. Whatever we see and experience after death. Accords with the way our culture and belief system has shaped our thinking. All of us, whether child or adult, pious or atheist, communist or capitalist, are immersed in acquired habits of perceiving. Since the dialogues were all Tibetan Buddhist or familiar with Buddhism, they perceived things from that perspective. However, while the details of our habits differ across culture, we all share regardless where we are from. A mentality of seeing the world in the terms of rewards and penalties, right and wrong. We constantly bounce between hope, hope, and fear under all seeing eyes of some imagined higher authority or judge. Our perceptions are soaked in this judgmental mentality. That is why when we have been 
unvirtuous we fear being judged and after that we will perceive a judge handling us a harsh sentence in reality there is no external judge there is no sentence our after death experience are simply the dividends we earn from our mental and emotional investment that is why the great indian master shanti deva said about the helm hell rims who constructed all these burning iron grounds of hell where did those flames come from all of them are mere reflection of your unvirtuous mind the buddha had said all of us might will seek some higher power in the brand in form will correspond with our habits tibetan text describe a court house presided over by dharma king and his assistants the lord of the dead other cultures and religion envision the judgment seat of a divine being a book in which virtues and sins are recorded by an angel or the weighing of deeds on the scale western near death experiences often describe life reviews in which they are encouraged to judge their own lives and common to all however is the universal law that positive habits and deeds result in joy while negative ones lead to suffering taking rebirth after we emerge from the bardo we will take rebirth with different body and identity just as our experience in bardo depends upon our karmic deeds mental and emotional tendencies and the spiritual attainment the same factor will be determining force behind our next rebirth it is possible to recognize our true nature our intrinsic awareness as it is in the bardo or indeed in any of the four passages of life if we can maintain that realization then we will be fully enlightened free forever from rebirth in the cycle of delusion however enlightenment takes many years of total dedication it is not achieved by attending weekend workshops or doing few minutes of few minutes of meditation for several years fully accomplish adepts advanced masters of spiritual practice may attend enlightenment and then take rebirth by choice rather than because of past karma their habitual chain of karma would have ceased or been translated for them phenomenal existence are nothing but projections of the qualities of their own mind if we keep aspiring to enlightenment and if we stay on merit meritorious path one day we too will reach this goal but for now the path taken by fully accomplished adepts is not feasible for ordinary people like ourselves who are without great spiritual attainment according to previous karmic causation according to people are bound to take rebirth in one of the six realms of samsaric experience people who have trained spiritually and possesses an abundance of merits will enjoy healthy future lives in happy world system if we have been peaceful kind caring helpful and wise and if we have put our meritorious attitudes into practice by word and deed we will enjoy rebirths in the world of peaceful joyful and helpful existence if in this life we have practiced seeing thinking feeling and believing in the presence of pure land we will take birth in pure land because of the mental habits that we have cultivated such a pure land will not be the ultimate pure land of enlightened state but a manifested pure land of great peace and joy not only will we enjoy the qualities of joyful birth but we will also radiate blessings of the pure land in finite to all who are open to receiving them we will still be under the control of karmic law but it will be a karmic cycle of happiness following such path of life is practical and attainable for many people and we must make it our own main priority what about ordinary people whose lives have been filled with negative emotions if our mind has indulged in anger greed or ignorance we are bound to face very hellish existence as a consequence as we travel through the four transitional passages the severe consequences of our negative mind will be just like wearing tinted glasses that darken everything we see instead of the familiar surroundings 
we knew when we were alive all around us will be images sounds and experiences of fear and misery such will be the phenomena appearances that arises in our awareness as a result of prevailing mental state that we nourished in life many of us whether we acknowledge it or not are engaged in and cherish such mindset day in and day out often it is an unconscious process although externally we may not think of ourselves as such a bad people we may be secretly bad in the toxic emotions selfishness and craving that modern culture encourages we must stop fooling ourselves and start to change our ways this very day while we are still lucky enough to be in human body and have a degree of choice once we are dead we will not be able to make changes because our karmic tendencies will take over they will drive us to be born again possibly in the non human realms where spiritual progress cannot be made we will wander through an unending cycle of birth death and rebirth full of suffering and excitement transforming our future it is important to reiterate that the hellish realms or pure lands in which we may travel after death or take birth are not external world systems situated somewhere else the experiences of enjoyment or suffering in different world systems after death are merely reflection of our own karmic tendencies it is like dream journey fabricated by our own habitual mental impressions let us bear this in mind whenever we read about karmic consequences the mind generates its own experiences of happiness and suffering after death as a result of tendencies gathered and reinforced through successive lifetime produced by the mind these experiences also take place in mind nowhere else it is equally important to know that as long as we are alive it is possible to change and improve our future of course we will always be subject unavoidable limitations imposed by physical and environmental laws but when we die our mind will be raised restricted by external forces so will be driven by the ingrained mental tendencies that we fostered in the past this is precisely the reason why the best way to improve the quality of our life death and after life is to work on changing our conceptual and emotional habits from negative to positive So there are three choices open to us open to us while we still have some time we could continue to endure the pain and suffering of this life as we ordinarily do without taking the opportunity to make any progress the karma of mental confusion aff- afflicting emotions and external situations will control our future destination then there will be no chance for true happiness to arise second choice we could try to secure the happiest and healthiest state that an ordinary cyclic existence in samsara can provide if we maintain a peaceful joyful helpful loving life then a happier and healthier future will be ensured as a result at least for a while choice 3 or we could go beyond this momentary cyclic existence the samsara of our life and secure the everlasting state of ultimate peace and joy called nirvana such an attainment can only come about through realization of the absolute truth reached through meditation and supported by right ways of thinking feeling and serving others if we let our mind face the right direction then whatever steps we take will lead us closer to our intended goal the meditations and practices described in this book are mainly based on liturgies of buddha of infinite light in sanskrit amitabha and his blissful blissful pure land sukhavati but there are other buddhas and pure lands whose liturgies may be used and even the prayers of non buddhist belief systems with similar qualities will be effective the important thing is to prepare in advance by meditating regularly on the liturgy associated with source of blessings in this book the term source of blessings refer to any object of prayer reverence 
and refuge there is a source of protection and blessing the source of blessings could be any higher inner or true source such as buddha bodhisattva saint sage or adept master any mental object will be powerful source of blessings if it has positive qualities and in appreciated by the mind as a positive the dying and dead as well as their helpers must rely on source of blessing as the support of their prayers meditations and rites the ultimate source of blessing is in ourselves as we all possesses and the enlightened nature however until we realize our own potential we must rely on external source of blessing to awaken our blessed nature and qualities in tibetan buddhism repeating the prayers of source of blessing such as the name prayer of buddha of infinite light is one of the popular ways to reach and receive blessing from the buddha the buddha of infinite lights vowed to liberate beings who invoke his name with devotion just as mother flies to her child's side as soon as she hears him cry mommy college a colleague of mine once asked yuklo yuko chatravala chatralova a great meditation master who give him some instructions to solve chain the primary teaching and practice of nyugna school of tibetan buddhism without saying a word of zigo chain chatravala chatralova replied you should first try to say the name prayers of buddha of infinite light 100 times a day with a strong devotion then try to increase it 100 300 and so forth if you could keep doing more and more one day a time might come for you that whatever you are doing you'll always be with the name of buddha in your breath with your breath and the feeling of his presence in your mind if that happens then when you die you will die with the name of buddha and the feeling of his presence if that happens as soon as you die because of the merits the blessing of buddha and your devotional habits all your perceptions will arise as the blissful pure land of buddha of infinite light your future will be in peace and happiness you will become a source of benefits for many others isn't it wonderful though i didn't realize it at the time years later i started to understand how profound and meaningful his words were if we have trained in the mindfulness of seeing all as buddha and his pure land then even if we encounter negative images sounds or feelings in the world it will be powerless to hurt us and everything will turn into positive phenomena it is like having a nightmare if you are able to recognize it as a dream and a, with and an illusion you can immediately render it to in, important because the attackers to vanish the like mist in the sunlight causing the attackers to vanish like mist in the sunlight in the same way if we can recognize any frightening experience of the bardo as an illusion or as a pure land it will become ineffective or will turn positive the frightening lords of the dead will turn into enlightened angels of wisdom and love as we will see later but we must begin to train now before death arrives if we practice every day or many times every day we will not be at loss when the crucial hour arrives ceremonies for the dead and dying We have seen that we can do something to help ourselves in negotiating the momentous transition of death. But what about the deaths of others, including those who have not had an opportunity to practice any teachings in advance? Can we, the living, help them? Every religion has rituals and liturgies or sacred texts intended to assist the dying and dead, which are also a comfort to survivors. in traditional judaism for example the dying are supposed to recite a prayer of confession and repentance 
and others will help them to do so if they are incapacitated. After a death, the survivors periodically recite in Kaddish a Hebrew prayer in praise of God's name. In Islam, people gather to offer their collective prayers for divine forgiveness of the deceased. In Catholicism, there is a priestly sac- sacrament of anointing a person on point of death, prayers for the souls of the dead, and a funeral mass. Tibetan Buddhism too has a rich ceremonial tradition associated with death. During the journey of my long and turbulent life, I have had many first-hand experiences of dealing with the deaths of great spiritual masters, close friends, and unknown strangers. Some were respected or powerful and many mourned their deaths. Others were poor, uncared for, and unknown. From the age of five, I lived and grew up in Dodrupchen Monastery, a famous learning and meditation institution in Eastern Tibet. Along with my fellow monks and novices, I oriented my entire life towards learning Buddhism, prayer, and meditation. After the completion of preliminary training, we studied and meditated on advanced teachings and began to serve the community. We were taught to help the dead and those who survived them through devotional prayers, ceremonial rites, traditional teachings and meditations according to the meticulous Tibetan Buddhism dead service manuals. Trying to take care of dead person by performing death ceremonies can be the saddest, yes, yet most serene and honest time of our lives. We have no appetite to aspire to anything else as we summon from the deaths, depths of our beings all support them that we can for this person's crucial journey into the unknown world. At the side of dying or a dead person, prayers come from the heart, uttered with our whole body, mind and body. The truth of life, its fragility, is naked before us. For the departed, all the structures of dignity, career and earnings have unexpectedly collapsed. Even their most cherished body is humbled, lying cold, stiff and motionless with no breath, dead. Ceremonies for the dying and the dead were among the most important community service we offered. I usually assisted the senior Lama in performing them, but sometimes I led the group of Lamas. On a couple of occasions, I led elaborative service lasting weeks as outlined in chapter 9. Most of the time, we would spend an hour or two offering brief service. Death ceremonies are performed sitting right by a dying person or near the body of the deceased. All ceremonies follow the same basic pattern. We start by trying to open up our own heart in devotion to the source of blessings such as Buddha of infinite life. Then we direct our minds to the dying or dead person with strong compassion and unconditional love from depth of the heart. With this devotion and compassion attitude, we begin the main ceremony saying prayers meditating and receiving blessing from the source of blessings for ourselves and the deceased. Finally, we see, feel and contemplate all as one with great peace. We conclude by offering all the merits we have created to the deceased and to all mother beings. All sentiment beings who is in previous existence have been our mothers. And by making aspirations that the deceased be reborn in the peaceful pure land, or as a joyous human being. I would not dare give readers even a hint of impression that I have any power to change the destiny of others or that I have any special insight into where the dying or dead person will go. But because of my trust in Buddhist teachings, after performing these ceremonies with strong devotion and love, I myself at least would often feel great peace. I would feel grateful too. How fortunate I am to have the opportunity to be with this person at their most important hour of need, to try to offer the best helping hand that I can. At the same time, I have always been careful not to push myself beyond my own mental, physical and spiritual limits. Many death ceremonies were occasion of a great joy with an almost celebratory atmosphere as people recalled all the peace and joy that the deceased had brought to themselves. Once during their lives, 
but there were also many great sober moments of sadness and hopelessness where the barriers could not where when the barriers between the dead and the living was so great that no one could reach the deceased even if we could touch them physically their mind was sinking into deep darkness as unknown and lonely world sitting beside his deathbed staring into the face of life's fragility leaves us no secure corner to hide it is always a powerful wake up call the death of a great teacher my first direct encounter with death was the source of great joy and celebration there was a great lama called sonam ragpa in the vengrol tribe my mother's tribal community of bolo provinces eastern tibet he was even known as ushul lama to the native tribes people he lived and taught in a small monastic hermitage at a distance of two days travel by horse from our monastery he was a great teacher and soul scholar the author of volumes of treatises treatises and master of tantric meditation and dzogchen but his main prayers and meditation were on blissful pure land of buddha of infinite life ushul lama died at around age of 60 i was in my early teens as messenger arrived at our monastery bearing the news i along with my teacher kyala kenpo and others rushed to him on the galloping horses we reached his hermitage late that evening and were met by his weeping monks nuns and lay devotees i had special relationship to pushul lama he was the one of the master who recognized me shortly after my birth as a reincarnation or tulku of his principal teacher he was also the most important lama of my mother's tribal group so i had a special obligation to look after his funeral services as instructed by kaila kimpu i went alone into lama's room his body was lying on his bed on his bed in the sleeping lion posture a meditational position i was young so i did not think much about it but i felt that the whole area and the room were in absolute peace i touched his heart area and felt a little warmth though he had died more than 48 hours earlier it was a sign that his mind was still in meditative absorption within his body and from kempo and said one can enter one no one must enter his room or make any noise around the house until his meditation is finished all kinds of prayers and ceremonies were going on but in the tents far away from lama's temple residence traditionally even the announcement of the death of a great lama would have been kept secret for days but in this case that wasn't possible the sad news has already spread through the tribal lands like wildfire when i checked on pushul lama the next morning i found no warmth at his heart area so four chosen monks were called in they washed his body with blessed saffron water dried it and new white clothes and completed all usual preparation needed to preserve a body for days then they seated his body on a small throne in the lotus meditation posture dressed in his monastic robes with ceremonial crown over his head his hands were crossed at his heart holding a vraja vajra and a bell flowers lamp food and other offerings were arranged on people of low tables in front of him i'm quite sure that the lama would have performed the simplest funeral but it turned into elaborate ceremony because the community wished it so although only about 30 monks lived in the hermitage hermitage streams of people from all walks of life kept coming and going from far distant no medic camps day and night crying and praying meanwhile we found a small sheet of paper with lama's handwritten writing on it it said as soon as i die i will take rebirth in blissful pure land i have recited the text on perfection of wisdom 108 times and meditated on their profound meaning in this lifetime therefore my name will be bodhisattva sherab ningpo whoever prays to me with devotion i will protect from any danger they might face while they are alive i will 
lead them to peaceful pure land when they die he concluded the peace with following five line prayers to himself to be chanted by his devotee in the blissful pure land you are shera ninpo in the snow land you were sonam trikpa in the future will be known as buddha of infinite life my root lama to you i pray please bless us me take rebirth in the blissful pure land this letter was amazing as pushul lama was known for his utmost humility and honesty he never said anything he did not mean the surprising thing was not what he wrote as we all had the highest esteem for him but that he wrote on the dawn of the 8th day his body was cremated in freshly built half stupa structure monks and nuns peacefully performed the cremation rites a crowd of lay people covered the whole home inside trying to circumambulate the cremation area as an exercise of devotion chanting prayers for rebirth in blissful pure land the whole atmosphere was transformed into a total devotional celebration echoing with sound of prayers and musical instruments never have i have felt so much energy of profound sorrow and so many sounds of heartful devotion from so many hearts emerged into one huge celebration ushul lama's death demonstrates great attendance in his teens he had been so disturbed that his family had to literally tie him up to stop him from hurting himself and others but through prayers and meditation he transformed himself and attained fearless confidence of being reborn in blissful pure land and leading all devotees there to this day i know of no one more learned cheerful and kind by following his example we too can transform we too can in joy and fearless confidence in life and at death dr elizabeth kubber ross the late psychiatrist who revolutionized attitude toward death and the care of dying in the united states reflected a similar view when she said the only incontrovertible fact of my work is the importance of life i always say that the death can be one of the greatest experience ever If you live each day of your life right then you have nothing to fear. End of introduction for the book Peaceful Death Joyful Rebirth. Thank you.